It was the sort of incident that demanded headlines on every news site, every television channel, and every global affairs podcast around the world. But it was the sort of incident where every one of those headlines said something just a little bit different. On the 29th of February 2024, in the early hours of the morning, something happened in the northern reaches of the Gaza Strip, just to the west of Gaza City itself. On a city road called Al Rashid Street, a convoy of humanitarian aid trucks was coming to its destination where thousands of Gazans waited to receive desperately needed food aid amidst widespread food insecurity and growing risk of starvation within the Gaza Strip. That, however, is where the consensus falls apart and gives way to confusion, hazy details, conflicting accounts, and some very, very forceful claims about precisely what happened on Al Rashid Street. According to some, the incident was a crowd stampede, one in which too many Gazans tragically died in the crush, while a few others were shot by Israeli troops attempting to protect the convoy. According to other accounts, it was a massacre, planned, deliberate, and carried out by Israeli troops against Palestinian civilians with complete impunity. According to still others, the truth lies somewhere in the middle, although with endless interpretations of just where within the middle ground is the right spot to choose. So in today's special episode of War of Graphics, we're going to do what we can do to sift through the confusion, the horror, and the bitter animosity on all sides and try to gain clarity on the Arashid incident. What exactly happened, who's to blame, what the world is going to do about it, and what it means for the prospect of peace in a war that's already claimed tens of thousands of lives. All right, before we can understand what exactly happens on February the 29th in Gaza, we first got to understand the conditions that made such an event possible. Of course, we assume that it's no surprise at this point to reveal that the Gaza Strip is among or one of the most brutal war zones on the planet today. Gaza is a territory under the internationally recognized authority of the nation of Israel, but it's primarily settled by an Arab-Palestinian population of about 2.5 million people and has been functionally encircled by Israel and its diplomatic partner Egypt since Israel withdrew its military forces from Gaza in 2005. Although we don't have the opportunity today to detail the history of Israel's relationship with its Palestinian population in Gaza, suffice it to say that it's a relationship that has drawn international controversy and condemnation for decades, and one that devolved into the current war on October the 7th. 2023. That day saw a brutal attack by the Gaza-based militant terror organization known as Hamas, one that killed upward of a thousand Israeli civilians and soldiers, and saw Hamas fighters take hundreds of hostages back into the Gaza Strip. The subsequent military counteroffensive by Israel, billed as an operation to rescue hostages, dismantle Hamas, and restore order in Gaza, has received increasing condemnation in recent months as tens of thousands of Gazans, including high numbers of civilians and even children, have been killed in the violence. Israel's counteroffensive has seen the vast majority of Gazans displaced from their pre-war homes, and while most are clustered into southern sections of the Gaza Strip, some have remained in the north, where Israel has claimed success in rooting out most of the Hamas organization's fighters and infrastructure. The problem now, or at least the most pressing problem among a whole lot of problems, is a matter of mounting food insecurity that's put much of Gaza's population on the brink of starvation. Israel's wartime blockade of the territory has seen humanitarian aid nearly entirely shut out in a territory that lacks either the agricultural capacity or the land development to support anywhere near the food demands of its population. Across the month of February, the UN's agency managing work with Palestinian refugees, UNRWA, reports that an average of 97 aid trucks per day entered Gaza, which does sound like a lot until the aid from those 97 trucks has to be spread among a population of over 2 million people. In reality, that figure of 97 is less than a fifth of the daily truck arrivals believed to be necessary to keep the Gazan population alive, and the deficit is showing more and more. As United States aid official Ramesh Rajasingham explained to the UN Security Council on Tuesday, the 27th of February, roughly one quarter of the Gazan population is currently, quote, one step away from famine. So when word spread that a large food convoy would be coming to northern Gaza, the part of the strip where hunger and food shortages are most severe and no similar deliveries have happened in over a month, that was understandably massive news for the Palestinians still living there. The Palestinians in question were living in a part of northern Gaza that's seen some of the most brutal and well-reported violence of the current conflict, and the location where the Al Rashid incident took place is just about three kilometers away from Al Shifa Hospital. It was there that Israel made global news with a military incursion into the hospital in November of 2023, alleging that it was being used as a headquarters for Hamas and seizing it despite the presence of thousands of wounded people and refugees. 
Since that time, this part of Gaza has become an increasingly desperate place for those who tried to remain instead of fleeing southward, and when the February 29th aid convoy arrived, it represented a lot more than a meal. It was a desperately needed lifeline. The convoy was moving northward on Al Rashid Street before dawn at approximately 4.30 in the morning, carrying aids that, according to a spokesman from the Israel Defense Forces, or IDF, had been sent by other nations including Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. The convoy had entered Gaza at the territory's southern border with Israel, before traveling north along the coast in a secured humanitarian corridor. Escorting the convoy were IDF troops riding in military vehicles, while other IDF equipment, including tanks, were located close to the route that the convoy was expected to follow. Although it's unclear whether any stops were planned for the convoy, before it reached its intended destination in the Rimmel neighborhood of Gaza City, it does not appear that the convoy was expected to stop where it did. But underscoring the desperation among the locals, eyewitness accounts have indicated that at least some residents living near the convoy's intended route began to gather the previous night in hopes that they might be able to convince the convoy operators or the IDF to hand out supplies to the people there. As best as we've been able to gather from reports around the incident, there wasn't so much one single crowd of Palestinian residents gathered at a single point, but instead quite a lot of people spread up and down Al Rashid Street, generally in the vicinity of one particular roundabout called Al Nabusli. That's a spot along the convoy route that would have come just after it would have passed through a nearby IDF checkpoint, the last on its journey. But this is when accounts of what happened begin to diverge. At this time, the IDF has published a preliminary review of the incidents, which we're going to examine first to understand Israel's presentation of events as they say they happened. According to the IDF, the crowd in and around Al Nawalsi roundabout rushed the aid trucks as they passed. Israeli soldiers fired warning shots from small arms and tanks to deter what Israeli military spokesman and Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari described as a stampede. That stampede, says the IDF, is where a majority of the Palestinians killed in the incident actually died, some crushed by the crowd or trampled after falling and others run over by aid trucks. While the IDF does admit that Israeli troops claimed the lives of some of the dead, they claim that the only Palestinians fired upon were people who had seemed to pose a direct threat to the IDF after the main stampede incident had concluded and after the convoy had been able to get out of the area. Said Agari in a press brief on March the 3rd, quote, Following the warning shots fired to disperse the stampede, and after our forces had started retreating, several looters approached our forces and posed an immediate threat to them. According to the initial review, the soldiers responded towards several individuals. Drone footage released by the IDF after the fact indicates that there were at least two separate events during the incident, at two points about half a kilometer apart. Annotated screenshot images released by the IDF highlight what appear to be people lying motionless on the ground on and around Al Rashid Street with Israeli military vehicles close by. However, we must note here that the IDF's video of the incident is heavily edited and presented only in short clips at the time of writing. Accounts from the scene have presented a very different version of events. Although the many eyewitness reports of the incident do relate to a range of individual experience at various points throughout the whole tragedy, we're going to aggregate together the general sequence of events in this telling of what happened. Generally speaking, non-IDF reports indicate that the crowd around Al Rashid Street were mostly docile prior to the IDF firing guns, initially tracer ammunition. Those gunshots were not a warning and were instead fired toward people in the crowd. Some accounts claim that this happened before any of the Gazans had gotten to any stopped aid trucks, while others claim that the Gazans in question were fired upon while they were removing food from the trucks. Said one journalist, Mahmoud Awadeo, who was at the scene, quoting, Israelis purposefully fired at the men. They were trying to get near the aid trucks that had the flour. They were fired at directly and prevented people to come near those killed. This then caused a panic and a stampede, during which time IDF troops continued to fire and kill the guards and locals around them, and in the confusion, aid trucks hit some of the casualties while attempting to flee the scene and get out of the IDF troops' line of fire. Another journalist, Ismail Al Ghul, reporting for Al Jazeera, has claimed that, quote, Israeli tanks advanced and ran over many of the dead and injured bodies. And even those allegations are the less damning ones. Some survivors from the scene have claimed that the IDF's actions were far more nefarious, with snipers firing on the crowd and the IDF opening fire not just with its infantry, but from armored vehicles, tanks, attack drones, and even naval forces on the nearby Mediterranean Sea. By those accounts, what happened at the convoy route wasn't an accident at all, it was a massacre. Whether it was accidental or deliberate, the carnage at Al Rashid was devastating to the Gazans who had gathered to meet the aid convoy in question. 
Preliminary estimates of the death toll have since been released by Gaza health officials who, we must emphasize, are employed by the territory's Hamas-run government but typically issue casualty counts that go on to be substantiated by international aid organizations. According to Gaza, at least 112 people were killed in the violence and over 760 more were injured. Further estimates have revised that number upward to over a thousand casualties in total between the dead and the wounded. Said Mwatasim Salah, who's part of the Gaza Ministry of Health's Emergency Committee when speaking to Reuters, any attempt to claim that people were martyred due to overcrowding or being run over is incorrect. The wounded and the martyrs are the result of being shot with heavy caliber bullets. On the grounds, local and international medics in Gaza attested that they were unable to keep up with a flood of injured people who streamed into local hospitals after the incident. Said one high-ranked UN official who visited Al Shifa Hospital twice after the event, quote, There were a lot of heavy injuries. There were many, many surgeries. One surgeon told me he had to do 18 surgeries in just the first night. That official also attested to seeing several people personally who'd been wounded by bullets, not by trampling or crowd crush injuries. An emergency room doctor at Al-Shifa named Mohammed Ekrab stated in the aftermath, Most of these injuries were the results of gunshots, injuries as a result of explosions or artillery shells, and tank shells. Most of the injuries were in the upper part of the body, in the head, the chest, and the abdominal area. The majority of the injuries were severe injuries. Roughly about 70% of the injuries needed surgeries. Ekrab also explained that because Al-Shifa currently only has two functioning operating rooms, no oxygen supplies, and very limited medications, many of the wounded were expected to die before they'd ever see an operating table. A doctor named Yeh Masri, who witnessed the event directly, attested to having seen dozens of people dead or injured by gunshot in addition to those who had been crushed or trampled in the stampede. Two other nearby hospitals, Kamal Adwan and Al Adwa, claimed that all or most of the people they were treating had been wounded with either bullets or shrapnel. The incident was labeled a massacre by the Gaza Ministry of Health, and military representatives of the Hamas organization have accused the IDF of firing directly at civilians' heads during the incident with the intent to kill. In the hours immediately following the incident, the Gaza Ministry of Health announced that the total death toll in Gaza since the start of the Israel-Hamas war had crested over 30,000, including 21,000 women and children. Also reported within the death toll were 7,000 missing and 70,000 injured. Although it's unknown whether the Al Rashid incident would have pushed those numbers past their most recent benchmarks, many, if not all, of the deaths were likely factored in. Hamas also tied the incident very quickly to the ongoing negotiations towards a ceasefire, said spokesman Izat Arishka. The negotiations are not open-ended, and we won't allow it to be used as cover for crimes against the Palestinians in Gaza. For Israel's part, it rejected the Gazan death toll for the incident out of hand, although the nation has not yet offered any of its own estimates on how many people were killed or what precise proportion were killed by Israeli gunfire. Nor has it offered clarification on claims made by the government prior to the release of the IDF's preliminary report. One IDF official told reporters shortly after the incident that Israeli soldiers had fired on, quoting Axios, dozens of Palestinian civilians who approached the IDF and got within tens of meters. That official had stated that the IDF had fired at the legs of the civilians nearby, hitting about 10 people. IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari, who we quoted earlier, reiterated shortly after the incident that the bulk of the deaths were not attributable to the IDF. And speaking about the Palestinians involved, he said, quote, Some began violently pushing and even trampling other Gazans to death, looting the humanitarian supplies. The unfortunate incident resulted in dozens of Gazans killed and injured. Hagari described Israel's actions as, quote, a limited response. However, Israel's statements have fallen short of what much of the international community would have hoped to see in the wake of such a tragedy. The drone footage that Israel has published, as we mentioned previously, has failed to back up Israel's claims in the way that the IDF might have hoped. While it does depict many people fleeing from the vicinity of aid trucks, including some who seem to take cover behind walls, it's spliced together from multiple clips and emits whatever happened immediately prior to the part where people are visibly running away. While we are war graphics, certainly they're not experts in diplomatic or international public relations, it bears noting that if there's one surefire way to ensure that people are skeptical of the Israeli government and believe that the IDF wants to cover something up, well, splicing footage while emitting critical sections is probably going to do it. And Israel has also faced renewed questions about the new status quo on aid deliveries in Gaza, where locals used to be able to keep order, but are now absent from the process. Until recently, these convoys were escorted by civilian police from Hamas, who'd generally been able to avoid this sort of violence and certainly avoid anything on this scale. But those civilian police walked off the job earlier in February, leaving not only a vacuum for desperate Palestinians to begin attacking convoys, but for them to now find people guarding the convoys who are simultaneously on the opposite side of a war. 
As for why the Hamas police quit, they'd been increasingly targeted by Israel. Recent convoys have borne the brunt of the repercussions from this change. For example, the World Food Program has had to suspend aid deliveries after a recent aid convoy, the worst in three weeks, had been surrounded by hungry Gazans at an IDF checkpoint and then been fired on in Gaza City. The WFP has since tried again and had its 14-truck convoy turned away at an Israeli checkpoint and then seen that same convoy looted. In the aftermath of the February 29th incident, Jan Egerland, Secretary General of Norway's Refugee Council, acknowledged the chaos, yes, around the aid line is becoming worse and worse because there's so little aid coming in. You see the aid trucks going full speed down the road, being chased by gangs of youth who jump the trucks and before our eyes loot mattresses, blankets, food, etc., to the desperate people outside who want to get some aid. All the while, more and more accounts of the tragedy have begun to circulate as more survivors speak to reporters in the aftermath. Eyewitnesses recount the chaos and confusion of the convoy's arrival. Speaking to BBC Arabic, one survivor, Ramzi Rehan, said, quote, We were informed that a shipment of flour would arrive through Al Nabulsi Street and that there would be no shooting. We went to get flour to feed our children. We went to Nabulsi Street, and before the trucks arrived, there was gunfire. As the trucks entered, we headed toward them, and as we tried to get the first bag of flour out of the truck, they began to fire at us. Some witnesses recalled waiting to be loaded into donkey carts, whose operators had to take several trips back and forth from the nearby hospitals to transport the wounded. Others recall being both shot and hit by aid trucks trying to leave the scene. However, yet more witnesses from the scene have contradicted these claims, including at times by contending that the majority of people injured were rammed or crushed by the aid trucks themselves as they panicked and tried to escape Israel's line of fire. Israel itself has called for a large, more independent review of what's happened, but as for when that review will be forthcoming, or whether it would be conducted by people who Israel's opponents agree would be impartial, we simply don't know yet. As word of the tragedy spread around the world, many global nations wasted no time establishing their position on what had happened. Jordan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia were quick to condemn Israel almost immediately after the incident, accusing the nation of deliberately attacking the civilians who'd become casualties at our Rashid. The South American nation of Colombia stated that it would stop importing weapons from Israel and likened Israel's conduct in Gaza to a genocide, a sentiment that more and more nations have begun to endorse in the wake of what's happened. China offered a strong condemnation of Israel's conduct and called for an immediate ceasefire to avoid future disasters of this kind. But no international response drew quite as much scrutiny as that of the United States, Israel's primary backer and main advocate in conversations among global powers about how to handle the Israel-Hamas war. American President Joe Biden expressed shock at the incident, although he simultaneously emphasized that the United States would attempt to weed through, quote, two competing versions of what happens. Elsewhere in the Biden administration, White House Deputy Press Secretary Olivia Dalton explains that the U.S. had spent weeks trying to get Israel to put together plans to ensure the basic security and safety of parts of Gaza where military operations have concluded. That includes the area where this incident took place, where Israel has claimed that Hamas no longer maintains a presence. Said Dalton, quote, We have yet to see those plans, and we're deeply concerned about that. Inside the White House, divisions among Biden's own officials were made more pronounced by the incident. In an anonymous statement provided to NBC, several staffers signed on to the position that, quote, saying there are two versions of what happened when we have video proof of what occurred is absolutely disgusting. On Thursday morning, we all woke up to a Hunger Games star massacre, weaponizing starvation and over 100 people dead. And this administration's response is that we need to clarify information. It's baffling. That said, the American response did extend at least somewhat beyond requests for more information. On the day after the incident, the US government took a unilateral and overtly symbolic step to push back against Israel, authorizing an airdrop of humanitarian food aid directly into the Gaza Strip. Said Biden, quote, aid flowing into Gaza is nowhere near enough. Lives are on the line. We should be getting hundreds of trucks in, not just several. We're going to pull out at every stop we can. While airdrops of humanitarian aid are a notoriously inefficient way of delivering urgently needed supplies, the message to the Israeli government is only amplified by America's choice, pursuing an inefficient and frankly insufficient option because it's still better than going through the corridors that Israel has established. And it's noted that UN staff has already begun assisting hospitals to assess the nature of the wounds received by injured parties. Elsewhere, among Israel's web of allies around the world, the United Kingdom denounced the deaths in northern Gaza, endorsing international demands that the incident be investigated in an impartial manner. 
France offered its own condemnation of, quote, far by Israeli soldiers against civilians trying to access food, while Germany's foreign minister has demanded a full explanation. Writing on X, the German foreign minister Annalena Baerbach wrote, People wanted relief supplies for themselves and their families and found themselves dead. The reports from Gaza shock me. Later in the post, Baerbach emphasized that Gazans are, quote, closer to dying than to living. In the United Nations, things got even more contentious and fast. In the hours after the incident, the UN Security Council convened a closed-door emergency meeting where Algeria, the Security Council's current representative from the Arab world, offered a draft statement that would have blamed Israeli forces for, quote, opening fire and causing the deaths of the people who'd been killed. 14 of the Security Council's 15 members supported this statement, including four of its permanent members, China, France, Russia, and the United Kingdom, as well as close US allies, Japan and South Korea, who are non-permanent current members. The United States blocked the resolution, something that, because of America's permanent status, rendered it dead in the water. Outside the Security Council, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres offered a strong condemnation of the incident, saying, quote, The desperate civilians in Gaza need urgent help, including those in the north where the UN has not been able to deliver aid in more than a week. If there's one thing that the rest of the world seems to agree on in the aftermath of the tragedy at Ar Rashid, it's that this latest mass casualty incident underscores the urgent need for a ceasefire in Gaza as soon as possible. Those calls only grow more desperate as the Gaza Ministry of Health has begun issuing reports of the deaths of children in northern Gaza, killed not by bullets or bombs, but by dehydration and malnutrition. International humanitarian warnings around northern Gaza have increasingly stressed the fact that local children are nearing that tipping point into starvation more and more frequently, and that if food remains scarce, the death toll in Gaza could begin to rise much more rapidly than it's already been. More targeted aid has begun to move into northern Gaza, including a shipment of vaccines and formula milk that made it to Al-Shifa Hospital, but no amount of aid that can travel in a single shipment stands any hope of making a difference. While the February 29th tragedy is a reminder of a danger the world is already well aware of, it nonetheless served to raise the urgency of a ceasefire agreement even further. In the immediate aftermath of the incident, Hamas officials stated they did expect to put ceasefire talks into jeopardy, a sentiment echoed by President Joe Biden when he was asked about the ramifications of what had happened. But despite those early warning signs, ceasefire discussions were able to continue to progress until the 5th of March, when Hamas officials indicated that the negotiations in the Egyptian capital city of Cairo had stalled yet again. Said Hamas political leader Bassem Naim, quote, Netanyahu doesn't want to reach an agreement. The ball is now in the Americans' court. The message underneath that subtext? The United States will have to convince Israel to return to the negotiating table if any progress is to be made. At the time of writing, Hamas does plan to remain available for continued talks, and to be clear, these are talks that the US has stated just recently it involved Israel just about accepting Hamas's terms for a ceasefire. Among the current points of disagreement, according to anonymous officials reporting from close to the negotiations, are the formation of a list of hostages that Hamas would be willing to release. It's not yet clear why that hasn't happened, but whether those disagreements can be resolved is now just as much about the clock running down as it is about both sides coming to the table. The issue at hand is the Muslim holy month of fasting, Ramadan, which is slated to begin at sundown on the evening of Sunday the 10th of March. At the time of writing, that's in five days, sooner by the time you see this, and it's this holy month that a ceasefire would cover, probably lasting about six weeks in total. The reason that the deadline is so urgent isn't just a matter of respect for religion, it also involves a critical element of fasting, something that will be very difficult and even overtly dangerous for people who are already malnourished and lack access to food. Worse yet is the religious significance across the Muslim world of a Muslim population being continually attacked during Ramadan, something that international observers as well as the American Biden administration fears could turn into a flashpoint that would escalate violence beyond just Gaza. That can include even worse violence from the Houthis in the Red Sea or by Hezbollah to Israel's north, or even the involvement of new players in the conflict, a list that in a worst case scenario could include Iran being pulled into the war directly. Ramadan or not, there's an even more important countdown happening. That is, the one that will determine just how long each person in northern Gaza has left before starvation becomes unavoidable. In total, about three 100,000 people are believed to be living in northern Gaza at this time, with very scarce food resources and very little access to clean water. According to the UN, one in six children under the age of two in northern Gaza is believed to be acutely malnourished, with that number only expected to rise as time goes on. 
Said the executive director of the UK branch of Doctors Without Borders, Natalie Roberts, quote, We know from our own colleagues that they're having to eat animal food, that they go without food for days on end sometimes. And so people are just completely desperate. And the minute you start trying to deliver food to the region without any sort of security for the convoy, then this was always going to happen. Aside from the United States, Jordan has organized unilateral airdrops of humanitarian supplies and Canada is considering doing the same, with America completing a second airdrop alongside Jordan over the last few days and seemingly poised to carry out further operations if the situation demands. The US has even floated the possibility of delivering a ship's worth of aid if road access to Gaza remains restricted or handled in the way Israel's been doing. But as of now, anything beyond the occasional airdrop is just talk, and that means that the countdown to starvation is continuing uninterrupted. The violence of the Arashid incident is a horrible tragedy, no matter what version of events is ultimately identified as the correct one. But what it is not, and it pains us deeply to say so, is a surprise that people on the brink of starvation would gather around and even attempt to stop and take from a convoy they know is carrying rare, precious food aid, well, that should surprise no one. That the forces of the Israeli military, accustomed to waging war inside Gaza with impunity and keeping order as they see fit, would fire their weapons and fire shells from their tanks, whether warning shots or no, again, should surprise no one. Whether those weapons were aimed above the heads of these people, or at their legs and feet, or at their hearts and heads, we simply can't yet determine. But the fact that we're even in a position to debate whether the deaths of over a hundred people and the injuries of nearly, if not over a thousand more, were a deliberate massacre or a tragic accident, well, that's a reflection of the dire conditions that made such an incident all but inevitable. People who fear they may starve will do everything they can to find food while they still have the strength to do it. Soldiers who are fighting an asymmetric war where they expect enemies to be lurking around every corner will perceive actions like those of the crowd at our Rashid to be a threat to their own lives. In conditions like that, when an acute crisis erupts like it did on February the 29th, the dominoes are going to fall as they are laid out, and people are going to die. In an ideal world, we'd be able to offer some resolution at the end of today's episode to definitively point the finger and lay responsibility for this tragedy at the feet of a clear perpetrator. But we can't do that. And while we hope subsequent investigations will be conducted fairly and published transparently, we've got to emphasize that that's not necessarily how this conflict works, and that we might not get resolution on this incident for a very long time. What we can do is to emphasize just how urgent it is that all parties to this conflict work to change the conditions on the ground, whether through a ceasefire, a more comprehensive humanitarian aid program, or, quite frankly, whatever else it takes. Call it a massacre, call it a tragedy, but the al Rashid incident of February 29th should not have happened. Now it's on all sides to ensure that an incident like this never. Now it's on all sides to ensure that the next incident like this never happens in the first place. <laughs>